Hi, and welcome back to the Save It For Parts channel. In this video, I'm trying to give a basic overview of receiving L-band low Earth orbit weather satellites. Now, I've previously done a video about low Earth orbit APT satellites. These are on a VHF frequency that's a little bit easier to pick up. All you need for the APT satellite signals is a handheld radio and a smartphone or other audio recorder as well as the software to decode the signals. Now, L-band is a microwave frequency that is transmitted by many of the same satellites. So the NOAA Polar Orbiting Series, NOAA 15, 18, and 19, as well as the Russian Meteor Series also use L-band signals in addition to the VHF APT signals. I might be throwing around a few acronyms here. I'm going to try to describe any that I use, and I'm going to try not to be too technical. APT stands for Automatic Picture Transmission, that's kind of a 1960s, 1970s standard that is easy to pick up with a ham radio, easy to decode, but isn't very high resolution. The microwave L-band offers a high resolution picture transmission protocol, HRPT, and this gives you a little bit higher picture, more data, uh, more visual bands, so you get more infrared, more scientific data, not just the visible light picture of the Earth. Now there are a couple other satellite systems that use this L-band and send down very similar data, including the European MetOp series. So in addition to getting a little bit better picture on the L-band, you also have more satellites to work with. All these satellites operate in a very similar manner. They follow a polar orbit flying around the globe from top to bottom, and they come over about twice a day, about every 12 hours. These are in a sun-synchronous orbit, so the idea is that the satellite will always see a similar part of the Earth at a similar daylight illumination. So if it was launched from the U.S., for example, it might want to see the east coast of the U.S. in early morning and late evening. If it was launched from Russia or Europe, it might want to see Europe in morning and evening. And that lets weather forecasters get a good idea of the day's cloud patterns, the next day's cloud patterns, thermal properties of the weather systems, things like that. These satellites use what is commonly called a broom scan, where they're basically scanning a wide area, sweeping a wide area with an imager. It's not quite a camera, it's more like a spinning mirror and imaging system, so it sweeps quite a wide area. You can think of these satellite imagers as something like a flatbed scanner, basically a long thin line that moves along and scans as it goes. And as the satellite moves, it basically sends down live what it's seeing. So the image that you're receiving on the radio is exactly what the satellite is seeing at that particular time. Some of these satellites also store their data and download it at uh, different ground stations like Fairbanks, Alaska, uh, some spots over in Norway, things like that. But unless you live right near one of those spots and have the right antenna, you probably won't hear that particular transmission. You're only going to hear what the satellite sees when it's within radio range of your particular receiving location. Now when we did the old VHF weather satellite signals, all we needed was a handheld radio antenna or TV rabbit ears essentially. Since L-band is a microwave signal, it's a much smaller radio wave coming in and it needs a little bit different equipment to pick that up. Ideally a small satellite dish. A parabolic dish will concentrate the signal and focus it onto your receiving feed of your antenna. And you don't necessarily need a huge dish for this. There are a number of options you've got when it comes to antennas. You could certainly use a big old C-band satellite dish. However, you'll need some way to easily move it and track the satellite as it goes overhead. You could also use a much smaller dish, something that you could hold in your hands, and you could hold this up in the sky, aim it at the satellite as it's passing by, as long as it's not too heavy and you won't get any arm strain from holding the thing overhead. And you can certainly mount an antenna like this on a tripod or other mount as well. I personally am using a surplus, uh, I believe it's a 5.8 gigahertz wireless networking dish that someone gave me. So if you can find something like that, this is a pretty good size, pretty good weight, and it's a very flexible dish that I've been using for a lot of satellite projects. Now another option is a parabolic Wi-Fi wireless networking dish. These are actually sold online specifically to pick up L-band satellite signals. They can be a little bit expensive if you get one custom set up for that purpose, but this is an easy way to get into it without having to build any custom antenna stuff. If you already have a Wi-Fi dish like this around, you can modify it slightly. I'll put some links to all of that down in the description below. And then, of course, if you are really cheap, you can make your own dish with something like an umbrella and foil tape or an emergency blanket glued to the umbrella. I've done that in a couple videos recently, and it actually works. And this is probably the very cheapest way 
to make a parabolic satellite dish antenna. Now it's not necessarily the best way because this is a very flimsy dish. It will be very difficult to aim and keep it steadily aimed at a satellite if there's any amount of wind. The foil tape and the spray glue doesn't seem to adhere very well to an umbrella surface so it will eventually start to fall apart and you can't really fold up the umbrella easily once it's coated in foil. So once you've built an antenna like this you've got a big bulky antenna that takes up a lot of space, is kind of inconvenient to get through doorways, and you'll have to find somewhere handy to store it. Now, you'll need two other major components of your antenna. The feed is the actual receiving part, the active part. The parabolic dish is just a reflector. It's just essentially a mirror for the radio signals. The part that actually picks up the signals and sends it into an antenna cable is called the feed, and there are a couple different kinds. Most of the satellite signals I'm looking at are circularly polarized, so the antenna on the satellite is kind of a helical shape, and it's sending down a helical radio wave. There are two different types of polarization, a left hand and a right hand. Now, most of the satellites that I'm working with are sending down a right hand, circularly polarized L-band signal. However, if you're using a dish, like I said, it's a mirror for the radio waves, so your feed is going to have to have the opposite polarization because the radio wave is getting reflected off the dish and it's coming in basically in the opposite direction to your actual feed. So you'll need a left hand polarized feed. Now you can make these yourself pretty easily out of little coils of wire. This isn't long enough, but this gives you an idea of the type of copper wire that I use for these. There are a number of calculators and helpful tools online to tell you how big to make your coil, how far apart to put the coils, you can make a scaffolding to hold your coil up using popsicle sticks or pieces of wood or straws. If you have a 3D printer, you can go on Thingiverse and you can download a design for a scaffolding, basically, that you print out. It's got the holes in it already and you just kind of coil your wire into that uh, printed out scaffolding and you've got your antenna feed. So here we have a 3D printed L-band helical antenna scaffolding and this is courtesy of Derek SGC on Thingiverse. My 3D printer had some issues with it. It's still mostly usable, uh, not the prettiest, but this is an example of what one of these 3D printed scaffoldings looks like. And then here's what one looks like with a backing plane or a ground plane behind it. You don't have to go quite this big, but I already had this circle of plywood cut out, so I just coated it in foil. This one also had some printing issues, so I've lost the top of my scaffolding, but it holds up the coil of wire well enough. Okay, I know that's a lot of info, but there's one other piece we need for the antenna, and that is an amplifier filter unit. Now, the standard one is the Nulek Sawbird Goes series. They have a couple different versions. There's the Plus Goes, which offers a little bit more amplification, and there's the regular one, which is less amplified and slightly cheaper. Now, these are designed for the Geostationary Operating Environment Satellite, or GOES, but they are flexible enough that they will work for low Earth orbit L-band satellites as well. They basically filter your incoming radio spectrum down to approximately the right frequency band, uh, around 1700 megahertz. So that filters out interference from cell phones, TV stations, uh, other ground-based uh, interference that you don't want. And then it also amplifies the signal, so it takes your incoming weak radio signal from the satellite, boosts it up to a point where your actual receiver unit has an easier time seeing it and decoding it. So this is another L-band helical antenna that I've made. I used thicker wire here, so I don't need as much scaffolding to hold it up. It just holds itself up. It's kind of screwed through the original uh, feed horn here of this dish. And then again, I've got a metal backing plane. This one is just a cookie can lid, and it works well enough. Now I have my Sawbird Goes LNA filter unit right here directly on the back of the feed. You want this to be as close to the feed as possible, and then the outgoing wire goes to your software-defined radio. You want to make sure this is the correct direction around. Your in should be connected to your helical feed, and then the output and DC connector should go out to your SDR. And the uh, power for this little filter is coming from your SDR through the bias T, and we'll get into that a little bit more later. And there's a little indicator light on the end here that tells you when it's powered. Now I've made a couple of these feeds in prior videos, so I'm not going to go over exactly how this is made in this video, but I will put some information down in the description. I will put some links to guides on how to do this, to some of the 3D files if you want to make 
uh, the 3D printed scaffolding or if you want to make some kind of a wooden scaffolding to make sure that you have the right shape of your circular uh, helical antenna feed. Now this video is not sponsored by any particular grocery store chain, but I'm really cheap when it comes to making equipment and I use just whatever happens to be on hand in my junk drawer. So yeah, this seems to work well enough. So that's your antenna sorted out. You will then need a receiver and I like to use a software defined radio. I personally prefer the RTL SDR blog series. Uh, the V3 is a very standard one. They're up to the V4 now and I think the V4 is actually a little bit cheaper and uh, has a little bit wider frequency range, so that's probably the better deal. There are certainly many other SDR units out there. Uh, I've experimented with a couple of them, but I find the RTL SDR to be pretty flexible, very affordable, and it's really my go-to unit for any of this stuff. Now, depending on the type of antenna cable you have, you might need a little adapter like this. So I have a female end on the antenna cable and a female end on the RTL SDR. So we just need a little male to male adapter to go between those. One co very common issue is that the center pin on these gets pushed one way or another and that breaks your connection. So if you're having signal issues, check that center pin. That is a very common problem. The RTL SDR plugs into a computer. If you're working outside, which we usually are when we're doing satellite stuff, you'll want some kind of laptop. I like Linux laptops because there's a lot of SDR software available for Linux. You can also use Windows and there's plenty of software out there for Windows as well. You can also use your cell phone if you want. You will need a on-the-go adapter, an OTG adapter, and that's just a little device basically that turns your cell phone's USB port into a regular old desktop USB port. Then you can plug in that SDR unit you can hook up your antenna and you can use your cell phone to download uh, the data that's coming across the satellite stream. This is pretty handy for use on the go. You can also combine it with another app that I'm going to talk about in a minute for uh, tracking the satellite. So on to tracking and scheduling your satellite passes. As I said, each of these polar orbit satellites comes across most parts of the Earth at least twice a day. I use a website called in2yo.com and this has info on a whole bunch of satellites. You can go to their drop down menu up at the top and select uh, some very commonly used satellites, the MetOps series, the NOAA series, Meteor. If you don't see a satellite that you want, you can put in the NORAD number or you can search for the satellite. Although be aware that N2IO uses some different names than some of the other satellite operators, some of the other websites, so they might not have the satellite filed under exactly the same name as another website does. I also use the SatDump website. Uh, they have a list of satellites and frequencies that are available, so uh, if you don't see something you want on N2IO, you could go over to SatDump, look up the satellite you're interested in, find the NORAD number, put that NORAD number into N2IO, and then it'll show you the orbits. You can also use desktop software like gpredict, which does basically the same thing, shows you the orbits of the satellites, and has some extra features like antenna tracking if you have an antenna that's capable of that. Now another app that I use a lot is Stellarium on my cell phone. This is an Android app. I think there's some equivalents for Apple. This gives you a heads-up display of a particular satellite. It uses your phone's accelerometer so you can aim the thing around, focus in on the satellite, and this is super handy for aiming your antenna. Okay, we've gone through the basics. Let's give an actual demonstration of how this works. Right now, I'm using an automatic tracking antenna because I just built one. You can do the exact same thing hand-holding it, so all the procedures here are basically identical. As soon as you know your next upcoming pass from gpredict or n2io or whatever source you're using to find your satellite orbits, you'll want to make sure your antenna and your SDR and your laptop are all ready and standing by a few minutes before the pass starts. Now a really good pretty directly overhead pass of one of these satellites can last around 10 minutes, but you probably won't get the very start or the very end of the pass because the satellite will be low on the horizon, it will be farther away from you so the signal is weaker, and it will probably be blocked by trees, buildings, whatever else. Now if you are hand tracking, you'll want to open up the Stellarium app, search for the satellite that you're interested in. I still find Stellarium to be inconsistent and frustrating because half the time I search and it just doesn't find what I'm looking for. So. Uh, you'll have to play around with this. It's not a very good app, but it's the only one that gives me the heads-up display. Okay, I force quit the program, reopen Stellarium, and here we have NOAA 18. 
So once you aim your phone up at the sky, it should give you this heads up display, AR type thing. And we can see NOAA 18, it is still below the horizon. So I just put some Velcro tape on the phone. And then when I'm hand holding this, I stick the phone right onto the back of the dish. You'll have the entire rig, phone and antenna aimed at the satellite. And you'll want to keep the satellite inside of that targeting ring in the middle. And as the satellite moves over the sky, just move everything with it and keep it centered in your targeting ring and that should give you the best signal. On the laptop you will want to be running a program called SDR++. There are other SDR programs. There's GQRX, SDR Sharp. I use SDR++ because I'm pretty familiar with it and it's pretty powerful. We've opened up SDR++. We have selected our generic RTL SDR unit. I have my gain set to maximum here. We might uh, talk about that a little bit more. We've checked that the bias T is on. I hit the play button and we should see some nice strong noise in the waterfall display on the right there. We can just double check the bias T. If we turn it off, our noise floor drops dramatically. And if we turn it back on, our noise comes back. So we're amplifying any signal that comes into the dish right now. Now, once NOAA 18 comes above the horizon and starts transmitting, We'll want to go down here and hit record, and we want to make sure we're in baseband mode. We have selected our save location. We can leave this name template alone. We want to be in wave container, and we want our sample type to be integer 16. Other thing you want to check up here, uh, we want uh, 2.4 megahertz in our sample rate. So uh, you can go all the way up to 2.56 with the RTL SDR, but 2.4 seems a little more stable and tends to work a little bit better. All right, we're starting to see those spikes. That is what a NOAA L-band signal will look like. On the waterfall, you'll get these vertical stripes. And I went ahead and hit record. You want to make sure you are tuned to the correct frequency up there at the top. For NOAA 18, it is 1.707 gigahertz or 1707 megahertz. While you're recording the pass, make sure that you keep your dish aimed at the satellite. So you'll have to keep an eye on that Stellarium window and continually move the dish slowly to track the moving satellite. If you bump it, if you uh, drop it, if you lose the signal, that'll just be a gap in your final image. Keep aiming the dish at the satellite through the pass, and then as the signal drops, as the satellite starts to fall below surrounding obstacles, stop the recording on SDR++. Once we've recorded the full pass, we can go ahead and open up this sat dump software, and we will want to select the correct pipeline for whichever satellite we just looked at. I have that saved as a favorite because there are a million different satellite pipelines in the options here, so it can be really hard to find the one you want. Anyway, we select the correct pipeline, we select the input file that we want, and that would be the baseband recording we just made. Then we select an output directory. Now our baseband format and our sample rate should already be automatically populated based on this file. So these you don't have to change. We hit start and the program will sit here and attempt to process that recording, decode the satellite data and create images. Uh, each one is going to have a slightly different appearance here. These little graphic representations are based on the coding type. Honestly, I don't understand what half of these are. Some of them have four constellations. Some of them have these two constellations. Some of them are just one big blob in the middle. You don't really need to know what this is, just that when it has a nice pattern like that, you're getting a good signal. And if you're getting a lot of frames here, you're getting some information from that recording. And again, all this stuff looks slightly different depending on which satellite you use. This is just what a NOAA HRPT decode looks like. Meteor and MetOp each look a little bit different. Next sat dump will go through a bunch of other steps and it will give you all kinds of mysterious messages. When it's all finished, it will go back to this screen. You may or may not get some warning messages off to the right here. This is the folder where I told SatDump to put the images, and we've got a variety of things that it processed. Most of these I kind of ignore. These are instruments which produce kind of mysterious low-resolution bitmaps that uh, I don't care about, and I don't know what they are. The main thing I want for NOAA is this AVHRR. This is the main imaging instrument on the satellite. And as I may have mentioned earlier, this outputs uh, two copies of each image. So there will be the original image. Uh, this is kind of what the satellite sees raw from its scanner. And then a corrected image. 
and this version corrects the image, makes it look more like what your eye would see or what a regular camera would see from the satellite. Now you'll notice we have lots of different color versions of the same pass, so each of these images is kind of a different spectrum range, uh, different visual spectrum, different thermal spectrum. Some of these are good for showing cloud temperatures, different elevations of clouds, all kinds of things that can help out weather forecasters. So first off we have NOAA 15. This satellite is unfortunately one of the worst. It's getting pretty old, the radio transmitter isn't very good, and the signal is not very strong. So I never get very much imagery from NOAA 15. Next up we have NOAA 19. Came over at really similar times, so looks very similar. The cloud patterns are about the same. And then NOAA 18 came over a little bit later in the day, so we've got a little bit of change in the weather here, but Again, overall, pretty similar images. We have Meteor M23 images, and these tend to be uh, pretty high quality. So you can see we've got a pretty good long range. We can see all the way from far northern Canada down into the middle of Mexico. We got a really good pass from this one. We had a really strong signal for a lot of the satellite's time above the horizon. So uh, this produces some of the better images, as far as quality and geographic coverage. And again, just like the other satellites, this one offers a variety of color spectrums, thermal images, physics images, things like that. And then here we have the European Metop B satellite. This one, again, very similar imagery. The transmitter on this was not quite as powerful, so I didn't get nearly as much of the pass. I got just kind of the middle of North America. You can see a little bit of the Great Lakes, you can see some of the Missouri River, so if you know what you're looking for, you can see some geographic features. When I post videos like this, there are always a few frequently asked questions. First off being, is this legal? Yes, at least in the US, in most of the free world, it's perfectly legal to listen to passing satellites, download the data, decode it, get an image out of it. As long as it's not encrypted, there's nothing wrong with it. I can't speak for every country. There are probably some wacky dictatorships out there that make this illegal. The next question I get is, why isn't this stuff encrypted? Why are all these satellites just giving away free weather pictures? Well, they're a public service. They are designed to be available to scientists, to be available to weather forecasters. Any small town weather office can get this imagery off of a satellite directly with just a dish. They don't need to subscribe to any service. They don't need to even have a phone line. They can get it straight off the satellite. So small town weather forecasters up in Alaska, out on Pacific Islands, Antarctica, other remote locations can grab this stuff without any other connection to the outside world. Now, yes, these days there's Starlink, there's Iridium, there's Inmarsat. There are a bunch of satellite internet providers that cover most of the world. So in some respects, these weather satellites are a little bit outdated. You don't really need to get the data straight off the weather satellite. You can just log into Starlink, get it off of NOAA's website or wherever else, but you're still paying for that service and maybe that service isn't always available. That being said, there are a couple military satellites that do basically the same thing and are encrypted. Um, those are actually legal to listen to in the US and they de-encrypt themselves over the US. So that's gonna be another video in the future though. We're not gonna get into that one here. Another frequent question is, what about the gain? Do you want to use automatic gain control or do you just want to set your gain to the maximum? I was curious myself because I've heard people say if you just max out your gain that you'll overload the SDR and you'll get a worse signal and you should always use Tuner AGC or automatic gain control. I did a second day of downloads from all the same satellites using AGC and here are some side-by-side -side comparisons. You don't really see a lot of difference with most of the main satellites. For NOAA 15, that questionable one, this was actually a better pass, more directly overhead, and I think it came out worse with AGC than just maxing out the gain at 49.6. So overall, it looks like AGC doesn't really do anything, it isn't really helpful, and it seems like just setting the gain to maximum and leaving it there works just as well for these satellites. Common problems that you can encounter with this as I think I said earlier, the little antenna connectors can come out. That little tiny center pin on those SMA cables likes to migrate around. So uh, if you're not getting a good signal, if your bias T is not turning on, take all your connections apart, double check all of your little screw on connections. Those SMA connectors are pretty much on everything these days, but they're not a very good connector. So again, they're very prone to just coming loose and falling apart. 
The other major issue is maintaining your aim. So if you're hand holding the dish over your head, if you're using it on a tripod, be as careful as you can, keep it aimed as carefully as you can. It's going to be tedious, it's going to have some muscle cramps, especially if you're holding it completely by hand. If you're trying to hold the thing for 10 whole minutes during a pass, you're going to start shaking, you're going to wobble it around, you might drop it. I definitely do, or did almost every time. That's why I went to the motorized mount. That thing eliminates all of my shake, all of my human error, and it gets me way better results than I could get by hand, but you can still get pretty good results by hand. Other issues you might have are related to constructing your antenna feed, positioning the feed in the dish. I will throw links down below to a parabolic dish calculator that tells you how far to put that feed from the surface of the dish, uh, and that should help you get everything lined up correctly. If you use a linear feed, like something that you would use for the GOES satellite, Sometimes that works, but it only gets you about half of the incoming signal, so it doesn't work as well. If your SDR drivers are a little messed up, you might have to close and reopen SDR++. You might have to turn the bias T off and on a couple times. I usually have to mess with that a few times to get it all working properly. Once this all works, it is really cool, and it gets you some really cool images. It does take a lot of trial and error. It definitely takes me a lot of trial and error. I don't get it right every time. Um, in fact, this morning I had some issues with it. I had to go back and retry stuff. I had to change a bunch of my timestamps to try to get things lined up, to try to get um, all of the things working that were supposed to be working. To make a long story short, if you're having issues, don't give up. Keep trying and eventually you'll figure out what works for you. All right, I think that's about it for this video. As I said, I will try to put more resources in the description links, uh, outside information about how to make antennas, where to get the software, all of the steps that I talked about in the video, and if you don't understand something, feel free to leave a comment. I try to read all those. I do try to respond unless there's something too crazy or the flat earth ones get deleted, but genuine, legitimate questions I try to answer, so feel free to ask those, and I would encourage everyone to go out and try this themselves. It's a lot of fun. Feel free to check out some of my other videos as well. I have another one on the VHF version of this, which is much easier, but a little bit lower resolution. I also have some videos where I mess with geostationary satellites, where I do some radio astronomy, and all kinds of other stuff. You can even go back and see me build some of these antennas, fail to get them to work, try things, and eventually learn more about the satellite hobby. If you want to see future videos like this, make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss what we come up with next. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.